My name is Igor Rudan and I will present you the PATH tool um, which was developed as a follow-up on the Equist conceptual framework and the Equist data science uh, computerized platform. Uh, why was it developed? Because Equist conceptual framework initially worked out how uh, cost effectiveness and equity uh, work together and how can you take into account both of them. But then this was by UNICEF developed into a data science platform which was presented by Sharu and uh, he's done a great job showing what this data platform can do and logically from that data science platform uh, arose a plan for implementation of Equist which had seven uh, key steps. And then as all this was developing uh, people came to step four and step four was understanding the bottlenecks and this is where it became really difficult because uh, there was no specific prescriptions in Equist how to deal with bottlenecks. There was tons of information but no specific prescription uh, which could allow you to really easily say what is going to change if you deal with this problem or that problem. So this is where Miki Chopper, Chief uh, of Health at UNICEF, um, came back to me again and asked me, can we perhaps develop a um, solution that would be a, a number, uh, rooted in numbers, that could visualize somehow these bottlenecks and show how numbers of deaths or diseases go up and down based on dealing with different uh, problems on the path to survival or to death. And uh, this made me think of something that we already um, uh, have done for the Bill and Melinda uh, Gates Foundation where we had a grant from them to uh, look into what could they achieve with biomarkers for neonatal sepsis. How many deaths can they avert of neonatal sepsis which was standing in 2011 at almost 1 million uh, deaths a year from neonatal infections and sepsis and they were wondering if they had biomarkers at different levels of health system would this change anything and what, what potential would it have to change anything? Is, is this a worthwhile investment for the foundation? Because they wanted, they were keen to invest in biomarkers if this could avert a large portion of these deaths but if it only had a limited potential reach then they were reluctant. So, But nobody could tell them really and um, uh, this was pretty much the same challenge. Um, uh, you know what are these uh, um, these, uh, these bottlenecks and, and how to think about these pathways that children go through um, throughout their first months of life and why some die and some uh, survive. So it's a similar question and we went back to drawing board and tried to remember what we did for the Gates Foundation in 2001, uh, 2011. So these data are practically outdated, they are uh, maybe almost a decade uh, old now, but it doesn't really matter, they're very illustrative with one million deaths a year of uh, what can be achieved uh, when you have such a big burden of death and then think about, think it through how, how these deaths even arise. Let me explain this to you. So we had to really go back to the drawing board and, and start drawing what do we know may be happening. So we had 136 million neonates being born into the world each year all over the world. What could happen to them? Well, let's imagine that there is no screening by any uh, biomarkers at uh, this point when they get born. And what happens then? Well some develop symptoms of suspected infection at some point and some never develop symptoms of suspected infection. If you never develop a symptom of suspected infection you're highly unlikely to die of infection and these, these children will all survive. But these that develop symptoms of suspected infection you know that these symptoms can be very very uh, broad in uh, a neonate and uh, uh, many of them will not actually be infection uh, but let's say that none of them get screened and then for some of those that develop suspected uh, uh, infection symptoms some, for some of them care will be sought and for some care will not be sought right and what can happen to those where care is not 
thought, well, some of them will survive. In fact, probably many of them will still survive because it either wasn't an infection or it was an infection, but luckily the child's immune system managed to somehow uh, prevent death. If care is thought, what happens then? Well, you can self-treat. You know, some people may just decide to self-treat their child and then the child may survive or die. Or they may invite community health worker and then they treat and the child may survive or die, right? And then they can go to primary health care where, again, you could potentially have a screening, opportunity for screening from blood to see what's going on. But let's say we don't have any screening at the moment. And then after that, after primary health care, maybe no action will be taken. And then if you don't take any action again, child may survive or die. In fact, it's hardly in a different position than it was just left uh, in the first, uh, very first branch there where nothing happened and they survived or died because nothing really happened here, right? Even here they self-treated or a, a community health worker treated, but this is just almost, you know, taking it to primary health care, nothing uh, uh, happening. It's just the same as they stayed at home, really. I mean, maybe there is a little bit of difference because maybe the, the doctor at primary health care was confident based on something that the treatment is not going to be necessary and then maybe the case fatality rate here is actually going to be lower than if they stayed at home because some of them, the, the primary health care doctor will decide that actually care is necessary and this basically clusters the most severe cases so probably these that are released have lower case fatality rate than if of all of the kids that developed some symptoms of sepsis. Now antibiotics are given and then parents may comply with this but we also have to keep in mind that theoretically parents may not want to comply with antibiotic treatment and then if they don't comply again we are in the same problem but probably case fatality rate here is going to be higher because there was some sort of a triage, so this no screening is not really no screening because you do have a screening when you think about it. You have a screening of a doctor at primary health care uh, level who does decide that the child needs or not need antibiotics. So there is some sort of screening, but it's not by a biomarker, it is by an individual, a human who works there, and they, uh, so, so they probably triage depending on sensitivity and specificity of their own personal judgment, they probably triage kids into more or less severe. So the case fatality rate probably here is going to be higher than the overall case fatality rate of those who just don't do anything. And here is probably going to be lower if the doctor is recognizing the symptoms and interpreting them in the right way. But if not, then, then you know, if he's very poor at this, it, he may even worsen uh, the, the, the thing. Okay, now if they comply, well, they could be sent home and after the antibiotic treatment or they, the doctor may be still at the primary health care level so worried about that child that even with antibiotics they say quickly, because I see some danger signs here, life-threatening signs, go to hospital anyway, I have no idea whether this antibiotic is going to work, uh, I have no, I, no way to check what infectious agent is causing this, so let's refer, go, go to hospital immediately. Now if they're sent home, after that they may survive, but they may still die because antibiotics may not work. If they're referred to secondary health care, they may comply, but they may not be able to comply for all sorts of reasons. They may not be able to pay a taxi, they may have seven other children at home who are also um, uh, needing to be fed, and for all sorts of reasons they just can't comply. If they don't comply, again, they're in a similar situation like this branch, actually in exactly the same situation. They've received antibiotics and went home and then they're either going to die or not. So this branch and this branch should have a very similar case fatality rate. If they can comply, no, in fact, it will not think about it because for these doctors was not as worried as for these. So this branch is probably, this, this branch is still needed because it's going to uh, uh, based on the doctor's assessment have probably higher case fatality rate than those that they thought, oh, let's give antibiotics, probably nothing, send them home. So this is more dangerous, more tricky. 
If they comply to go to secondary health care, they may again survive or die. But how? Let's think how. They come to secondary health care and again there is an uh, opportunity for screening. If there's no screening, well, um, they could be treated or no action taken. If they're treated, they can survive or die. If no action is taken there, further action, then they can also survive and die. So this is actually what can happen to a neonate uh, in terms of uh, getting neonatal sepsis symptoms and then eventually progressing to a proper sepsis severe form and death. But what we can see is that in all this there are four points at which if we had information from the blood on what's actually going on with the child, we may alter their fate. What could we potentially want from a biomarker-based test? We could want it to tell us, is, this, is there a bacterial infection present in this child? Yes or no? Because the child could have fever or look sick or you know, have all sorts of symptoms that could be sepsis. But what we're worried about is, is this a bacterial infection? It may be viral, ob obviously. So, but we're worried about bacterial sepsis. So, it would be very good to know whether there is a bacterial infection uh, going on. Then, we could also um, be interested in, is there indication in child's blood that this infection has become severe? so that it really requires immediate hospitalization and life-saving treatments there. Uh, which is different from knowing whether it's bacterial or viral. This is another level of information. Is it actually severe? Do, do we see that the child is fighting for its, uh, its life? And then finally, if we could do this, it would be fantastic to know the exact etiology. You know, what is it? Is it uh, which bacteria? Is it why? Because it would help us pre prescribe the correct antibiotic in a baby, which cannot tell us anything about itself. So th those are three potential useful pieces of information which we could have. And where would we use them? Well, it would be great to have them uh, either here when they are all born, or here when there are some symptoms of suspected infections, or here when they are at the primary health care, or here when they come to secondary health care. So it would be great to have uh, from their blood uh, some information about is it a bacterial infection in there, is it severe, and what precise etiology are we dealing with and need to address. There's no use really for it anywhere else when you think about it, because simply at home, you know, they're going to self-treat or not, uh, depending on the child looking sick. They don't really, are not going to do anything differently based on any of this knowledge. Neither would community health workers probably, right? So it is really in, um, in, in these four scenarios where we could use it. Uh, speaking of which, in scenario B, you would think that actually it would be, it would have to be community health workers or even the parents at home who are educated to, to, to use this to, to test their own uh, child. What is different between scenario A, B, C and D? The number of kids that would need to be tested is hugely different. Here you would need to test all 136 million neonates to check that they are not having an infection after birth, which, you know, feasibility becomes an issue. Here it's going to be much less because quite a few of all um, kids in the world will develop some symptoms of infections, right? Here the number is even much smaller because it's just a fraction of those who develop symptoms that are even going to decide to seek care and to seek care at primary health care level. And this is really for those which pass the primary health care and are referred to secondary health care unless they go directly to secondary health care because they live next to the hospital and they're really worried. Okay, now, which of these informations would be useful at which level? At this level, first level, I would say only whether it's bacterial or not, because basically that would trigger everything else, whether, whether it's severe or not. I mean, it doesn't really matter if you're just screening all neonates 
for the infection. If it's severe, you're going to see that it's severe, that something is terribly wrong. So basically, what you want to know at this level is really, I mean, if, especially because that test would need to be so applicable that you can cover every single child in the world. So if you want to know, answer to one question at that level, I don't think it's going to be, you know, which bacteria is it or whether it's a severe infection. Just, just, you just want to really triage, is there a worry here, is there a concern? And then you, you can worry about these things uh, later. At this level, if already there is a symptom of suspected infection, then you would really want to know that it's severe. So when you're just exploring, uh, you know, seemingly healthy newborns, or, or, or you know, you, you would not worry uh, about anything whether there is any bacteria in blood. Whereas if there is a symptom of suspected infection, you do become interested in whether it's severe because then you need to really refer them immediately. But why would I not worry too much about etiology here? Because this is not the level at which you expect antibiotics to be available. So you just really want to know here whether the kids should be rushed to hospital immediately or not. And you don't worry about the etiology because you don't know. You don't have uh, anything to do, antibiotics to, to, to deal with this. Well, at the primary health care level, you do want to know potentially uh, whether there is a bacterial infection or not, you do want to know whether it's severe and you actually do want to know the etiology because you may be able to do something about it. And at this level, at secondary healthcare, you no longer care whether it's severe because they already reached the secondary health uh, care, which is why we are interested in the first place whether the infection is severe. But you'd still want to know whether it's bacterial or not and you still want to know the etiology because now you have a much wider spectrum of antibiotics to to draw from, okay? So do you understand how uh, each and every one of them is actually different, you know? And at the first level, only one information would be useful, and the second one and two, at the third all three, and then the fourth one and three, huh? Okay, so now let's think through what would happen. This is going to, this is what we modeled a little bit. From 136 uh, million neonates, we knew that there was about 1 million deaths, which actually 909,000 to be precise, some, sometime there in, in 2000. And, uh, one of these Churg estimates were uh, for, for one of the years, whether it was 2008 or which one, was that it was 909,000 um, 909, uh, newborn deaths in the world out of this 136. So this gives you the global case fatality rate of 0.67%. So uh, the newborn, once is born into life uh, over the next month, has 0.67% to die if you just look at the whole world and all newborns. But clearly we know that that's not representative for many groups. Now, if they had a suspected sepsis, uh, we think that about, uh, most of these were based on expert opinion at the time, we just tried to piece it together using expert opinion. If there was some hard evidence, we used it, of course, but you should assume that this whole model is based on a combination of some evidence we had, uh, which was obviously not terribly uh, precise or maybe globally relevant, and uh, quite a lot of expert opinion just feeding in uh, from the people who really knew uh, how to deal with uh, sepsis, okay? So it seems that out of um, 136,000 neonates, you would expect about maybe 15 to 20% of them to show at some point in that first month a sign of suspected infection, all right? Uh, which means that these 112 million who never show any signs of infection, they're all going to be fine, their case fatality rate drops to zero. But because for 80% of them the case fatality rate drops to zero, that means that if you have a symptom of suspected sepsis, you, your case fatality rate goes up quite a lot if you're in that uh, subset. And in fact, of all the kids that uh, develop symptoms, we believe that about 4% will die. All right? And all deaths will be here. Now, we estimated that about 9 million do not seek care and 14 million of those suspected sepsis do seek care. Clearly, those who do not seek care, their case fatality rate is going to be even higher because the fatality rate of these who seek care will be lower because they're going to get some care, which means that it's necessarily higher here. So it goes up to 6.40%, okay? What about these guys here? 
theirs dropped to 236. So clearly the health system is not going to be able to deal with all of them and treat them. Some will still die, but you see, you're almost, um, um, you know, you're almost cutting your risk by a third if you seek care and uh, then, then if you do not at this point, all right? So that's a huge difference. And this is how we believe they are then split between home care, community health worker care, primary and secondary health care. And you would imagine that out of these 2.36, the highest uh, case fatality rate would be from home care, uh, slightly lower from uh, community health worker, uh, still lower in primary health care, and the lowest if they eventually come under the secondary health care. But still, you know, in comparison to, so if you just reduce the risk by a three uh, by actually seeking care, uh, where you seek care, you can almost also reduce your risk by a three because if it's at home and if it's at the hospital, you're three times less likely to die in the hospital uh, if you sought care than if you're self-treated, okay? Then, you remember those uh, four points for information? It's here, here, here. So these yellow triangles are showing you where we could actually have some useful information. And I'll show you why this is important when I get to the end of this. So this is what happens. No action antibiotics. Now, how come that case fatality rate is now all of a sudden higher in those that were treated than in those that were not treated? because we factored in the sensitivity and specificity of, um, of uh, primary healthcare doctor's assessment, which in fact split this group into those who are fine, and this is why their case fatality is lower, and those who are actually not fine and do require treatment, and even with treatment, of course, if this algorithm worked well, uh, their case fatality rate is going to be uh, higher than of these who doctor didn't think were uh, going to be in danger. In fact, if the doctor's algorithm was 100% sensitive and 100% specific, you would even expect this to be zero. So this, this, this is not zero only because the doctor did not make a perfect assessment of who needs and who doesn't need treatment, okay? Now, comply or not comply, well, if the doctor thought that these are in need of antibiotics and you don't comply, then your case fatality rate is actually going to be quite high, <coughs> almost as high as those here who did not uh, seek care after having a suspected sepsis. Um, in fact, you'd be expecting it to be even higher, probably because, because this is a subselected group that doctors have looked at, so maybe this is wrong. Um, and uh, e maybe this should be even higher. Uh, then uh, those who comply obviously have smaller case fatality rate and then those who refer to secondary health care, clearly they are going to have a higher uh, rate than those sent home. Why? Because again, uh, these who complied and the doctor was happy and sent them home, again, uh, if he was perfect in his judgment, we should see zero case fatality rate here. So this just reflects that he was not perfect and some still died home and they should not have been referred home. They should still be referred to secondary healthcare. But sec these that are referred to secondary healthcare, they are the, by far the most um, uh, endangered group with the most severe forms. And uh, uh, then some could not comply and this is where you really expect the highest case fatality rate. Why? Because those were the ones that even doctor after treatment still thought they need to go um, urgently to hospital and if they can't go they will be most likely to die. And if they complied they will still be dying because these are kids that are already in danger, right? Now when they come to secondary health care you could treat and take no action. Now how come that no action has better case fatality rate than treatment? Because these already came to secondary health care being treated at the primary health care and if the secondary health care pediatrician thought that there was nothing wrong with these kids, they're going to be fine, then they will probably be fine. Whereas if they needed to be treated, that means that they were really in a severe condition and of course some will die. So this is now um, based on, as I said, a uh, model that used quite a lot of expert opinion and some uh, data which is not terribly sophisticated uh, uh, and a re representation of what may be happening on the path to survival for your first month or dying. And you can 
Remember now those four places in this where I told you that there is a possibility for some screening and if we could have additional information then maybe we would do something differently. And now this is the key thing that I'm going to say in the whole presentation. So basically what these four triangles represent is the place where we could get additional information which we don't have at the moment and then the value of this information would be that we would do something different and if we did something different that would result into kids moving into branches of this big tree which are associated with the lower case fatality rate. So basically this is what's happening without this additional information. And how would this additional information from uh, biomarker diagnostics save lives? It would save lives by providing information that would make you decide to push a child from this branch into uh, this branch or in fact from a branch which is leading the child to a higher case fatality rate to a branch that is leading the child to a lower case fatality rate. And basically that is the mechanism that this, uh, through which this works. Uh, or to, to, to not make um, um, a mistake here, um, basically uh, sometimes actually it would be sending them to <laughs> a branch of higher case fatality rate, but they would be the kids that are actually contributing to mortality in this lower case fatality rate. So for example, perfect judgment at this level would leave this at zero and send kids to a higher chance of survival because they would be the ones dying uh, here. So that is the whole um, kind of a logic of this uh, kind of a concept. And now I'm going to take you through a few slides that are showing you just how complicated this gets when you start thinking about the details. So I'm just going to take this part for now and this is what happens at this part. These green are the parameters that you need for this model. So 17% we believed had symptoms of suspected infection. 61% of them sought care uh, and then the remaining 39% did not. Then you needed to know what proportion of them developed sepsis, uh, what developed severe sepsis and what was the case fatality rate of untreated severe sepsis and how many deaths do you expect here. And then again, look at this branch. Um, we're going to move from them to here, to this part. And for this part, you needed again a parameter. What proportion of those with suspected sepsis who sought care would self-treat? What proportion would be treated by village doctors? What proportion would go to primary health care? And what proportion would go directly to secondary health care? And we thought this, these were the proportions. And then what happens is, again, you look, you plug in your case fatality rates, and let's follow each branch. Now, you needed further parameters if they self-treated. What was proportion that developed sepsis, severe sepsis? What is the effectiveness of home care intervention? This is something that could be much uh, better, obviously, but we thought it was about 10%. And this is why it resulted in so many deaths if you self-treat. It's not, whatever you do is not effective. Very similar thing, very similar reasoning with the um, community health workers. But here we added a bit more to the effectiveness of community health worker treatment. Instead of 10%, we said it's 15%. Okay, uh, what happens at primary health care? This is really complicated because you remember that the key thing here was the clinical algorithm. And because of imperfection of clinical algorithm, the doctor's assessment, some kids were actually releasing without treatment, whereas they should have been treated. And how do you work this out? Well, we worked it out based on se uh, assumption of 70% sensitivity and 70% specificity, what happens to a total of 6.4 million. And these are the false positives and the false negatives. So because of those false positives and false negatives, you now have some here which will die, all right? So doctor says no, but the sex sepsis is present. So from 528,000 uh, uh, 528, of those who were misdiagnosed, some will develop severe sepsis, apply 
case fatality rate and you will have deaths because of the doctor's mistake in assessment of the situation, all right? Uh, what's happening here? If they were prescribed antibiotics but did not comply, these were our parameters, but I think something was perhaps wrong here because the case fatality rate of uh, these babies should be higher than if they st stayed home and uh, did uh, nothing because the doctor at least um, applied the clinical algorithm. What if they were uh, then sent home or um, uh, referred to the secondary hospital? Here again you have um, uh, people who susp had susp suspected sepsis, complied, received antibiotics from primary health care doctor. You apply clinical algorithm again with 70% sensitivity, 70% specificity, and you are left with this situation. This is again doctor failing to recognize severe sepsis, releasing some of the babies home after treating them and because of the case fatality rates that we apply, some of them died. What if they get referred to secondary health care? Well, they could comply or not comply. We thought that maybe 60% of them do comply, but a good 40% do not comply. If they do not comply, you know what's going to happen. Severe sepsis, untreated severe sepsis and deaths. And case fatality rate of 8.26, that's the highest one because the doctor treated but still was worried and they couldn't do anything about it and this is why we have deaths here. What then happens here? They are referred to the secondary health care, they complied, some will have severe sepsis and then we have to plug in the effectiveness of hospital-based intervention and this leaves us some where this did not work and this is why they still die in hospital, all right? And this is how we got to the number of hospital deaths and the case fatality rate of those who comply altogether. Once they are in the hospital, well, some develop sepsis and then you have clinical algorithm at the hospital. We thought that this one would be better clearly than the clinical algorithm of the primary healthcare physician, we put it at 80% sensitivity, 80% specificity, just to see what happens. Maybe it's better, maybe it's 90%, maybe uh, it's, uh, maybe the primary healthcare is lower, we don't really know. But um, this was our best guess, just to show what happens if we plug in different numbers. And clearly what you're worried about here is misclassification, because they are at hospital already, they are clearly in danger, and if you misclassify here, that's going to result in death and this is showing the whole thing so these here are these deaths here in the hospital uh, are part of the hospital deaths that are actually the result of clinical algorithm malfunctioning uh, whereas other deaths are just because simply nothing could have been done all right so this is they were treated but even with treatment some will still die because uh, effectiveness is not 100% even at the hospital, right? And those are 18,000 hospital deaths that, are, that, that nothing could be really done about. And that's the only ones really that nothing could be done about, okay? So now that we understand this, we can ask ourselves, what if we had such brilliant biomarkers with 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity diagnostics that would improve our understanding of what's happening to the child at each level. What proportion of global deaths could we save by just having the right information at the right time in the right place? Let's see. We have to explore eight different scenarios. The first one is what if we screened all neonates in the world with a bacterial infection test which is 100% sensitive and 100% specific? Then second is what if we did that after symptoms of suspected infections? Then the third scenario is what if we could check for severe infections after the signs of suspected ones? Four, five, six are all at primary health care, seven, eight at the secondary health care. Let's see what happens. 
Option one, you have active screening for bacterial infection by community health worker through population-based programs. How does it save lives? You remember 136 newborns, case fatality rate 67%. You have screening for this. What would happen? It would save lives mainly through change in care-seeking behavior, all right? So we would think that being able to say to all mothers at this level or parents that uh, your child has a bacterial infection, you have to seek care, we believe that this would change lives, save lives primarily through change in care-seeking uh, behavior. So if there was increase in care-seeking based on positive test results, we reckon that for each 100,000 cases of suspected infections, you would save 4,000 lives. Definite life-saving potential, but the costs and other test requirements do not make this option one feasible anytime soon. But if it was feasible, you would be saving um, 4,000 lives per 100,000 cases of suspected infection. We will see what this means globally later, because if you think that about 17%, uh, which is like uh, 25 million or so, had the signs of suspected infections, right? So 25 million, that is 250 times um, of 4,000 lives, which is a lot. It's a lot. It's almost like everyone that would be <laughs> saved if you could just, uh, you know, have something like this. All right, we'll see how much later, all right? I'm not going to guess. Okay, so how does it work? 100,000 healthy newborns are tested, 17,000 would develop suspected infections, 61% would seek care anyway, and tests will not change this even if it was perfect. But 39 would not seek care, but the test may change this. And then 6,000 630 of cases of suspected infections could be helped in this way, potentially. And if you assume the change behavior based on test of only 50% to what it is now, so that means that out of zero, you get 50% of parents seeking care. This is how we got to 3,300 seeking care. And this is your difference in case fatality rate among those who seek care. And this is your potential impact fraction, which is 134 deaths averted per each 100,000 healthy newborns tested. And that means that effectiveness of this intervention is 20%. So that is actually the correct number. You would be able to reduce the total number of deaths in the world from newborn infections by 20%, which is a lot. And if everyone changed care-seeking behavior, then it would be 40%. So there's definitely a life-saving potential here, but it's also massive population-based intervention would be required and, and huge costs, obviously. All right? Now, the second option, you have an uh, option to diagnose bacterial infection by parents or community health workers based on symptoms of possible infection. How does this save lives? It saves lives in actually several ways. Firstly, it changes care-seeking behavior. Also, it enriches true positive cases of sepsis among those who seek care, which is also important. So it, it drags the, those who would die from not seeking care into this care seeking, and it will give powers to community health workers to treat neonatal infections. That is another important thing, because in many countries, unfortunately, doctors are not keen to allow community health workers to use antibiotics, because they are not trained uh, uh, medically, uh, as a medical doctors, and then this really, uh, we don't know how much harm this is actually doing. Doctors want to preserve their status, right? So, um, in fact, this we figured out could, for 100,000 additional cases of sepsis who choose to seek care, uh, this would save as many as 7,410 lives. So this really requires attention. Now, how does it work? You have 100,000 newborns with suspected infections tested. This is the number that would truly develop sepsis. Uh, this is the number that would seek care anyway. This is the, the not seek cares. But now, these are the cases of true sepsis that could be helped. You assume the change of behavior of 50%. They end up seeking care based on a test. And luckily here, the difference in case fatality rate among those who seek is big. And you avert 470 deaths per each 100,000 newborn, which means that the effectiveness of this intervention in newborns with suspected infection would lead to the 12% reduction in mortality globally 
uh, for all neonates. So that shows you that um, with a similar level of change in care-seeking behavior, you could save quite a lot by only targeting those 17% uh, who um, develop symptoms of sepsis in comparison to the first scenario. So in this scenario, you only target 70% of children who actually develop symptoms rather than all kids, but as a trade-off, your uh, life-saving potential is no longer 20%, it's 12%. So here is a case where you have to decide whether uh, what, what is more cost-effective. Is it more cost-effective to... Uh, this all depends on the cost of the test, obviously. You know, um, is it most cost, more cost-effective to uh, test every newborn? Um, or um, you know, uh, to, to the, uh, achieve 20% reduction, or is it more cost-effective to uh, just focus on 17% of them but achieve 12% reduction, all right? Now, the third option is diagnosis of severe infection by parents or community health workers based on symptoms of possible infection. How does this save uh, lives? Um, so, it would, again, change in care-seeking behavior, enrichment of true positive of severe sepsis among those to seek care, and this test would have exceptionally li large life-saving potential because for each 100,000 additional cases of severe sepsis who choose to seek care, because severe sepsis are the ones clustering deaths, 52,000 lives could be saved but requires access to secondary healthcare. So only if all of them could really access secondary health care. Let's see why. Because this is the severe sepsis out of 100,000 newborns were suspected, and now 61% would seek care anyway, and 15% of them would go straight to secondary healthcare facility, so the test will not have any impact of any of that. But 91% would not go straight to secondary healthcare facility, but the test may change this, and then you get 5,000 cases of severe sepsis that could be helped. You assume that 70% would now want to change behavior rather than 50 because this is a severe disease, but only 40% would actually have any access to secondary healthcare. So this is the problem. So this is how we worked out that you would avert 661 deaths per each 100,000 newborns, which at the global level would be a 16.8% reduction in mortality. So look how useful this is. This is much better, in fact, than the previous example. If you, so, so what would you would really want to know once the symptoms break out is, is this a severe infection? So once you notice a symptom uh, of sepsis in a baby, what you really want to know is if this is a severe infection. You don't care whether it is bacterial. You don't care about etiology. If it's severe, just take them to hospital. And this is the most direct way to save lives because no matter where these kids are, whether they're at home, community health workers care, primary, secondary health care, if you see that there is a symptom and you decide it's severe, then just take them to hospital. And this is how you save lives basically, all right? Now, what is the fourth option? The fourth option, if you remember, is at primary health care facility and you are able to diagnose bacterial infection. How does this save lives? Primarily by reducing the number of cases of true sepsis who reach primary health care but never get antibiotic treatment because the doctor or trained community health worker missed the correct diagnosis due to imperfect IMCI algorithm. The test would need to be extremely sensitive to have a potential to save many lives. And this is what we worked out would happen, that uh, out of those who come to primary health care, but note that this is not, now we're talking about much smaller numbers than either all global newborns or the global newborns who develop some sort of a uh, sepsis symptoms. We're talking about those who have actually sought care at primary health care. And these are numbers of really developing sepsis. This is the difference between sensitivity of screening tests which would be perfect in this case, and the clinical algorithm, which we thought was at 70%, just for the sake of it. And then let's see that 50% change in opting out of treatment is also the secondary lifesaver we should take into uh, consideration here. So this is the number of additional cases of true sepsis that could be given antibiotic treatment, which would not really because of the clinical algorithm before, but now they would. And if we assume effectiveness of antibiotic treatment at the primary health care facility of 35%, but you see how complicated this 
all of a sudden gets because you need all these parameters and you have no idea what they actually are. We're basically largely guessing based on expert opinion just to see what happens with the numbers. But you see how incredibly complicated this all is. So if you have a 100% sensitivity of the test, ensures that no newborns who would have received the treatment are now left out. This is what the difference in case fatality then becomes. This is the number of deaths and effectiveness of this information, of this intervention in newborns with suspected infections who come to primary health care is 17% reduction in mortality. But this 17% is not the global reduction of 17%. This is 17% reduction among those who reached primary health care. Just like the previous one was the reduction of um, uh, those who had symptoms, which is global, because those who don't uh, develop symptoms, they don't die. So all deaths were clustered among those who developed symptoms. So, so those first two examples were both at automatically telling you the effectiveness at the global level and the reduction at global. This is showing effectiveness among those who reach primary health care, but that is not transferable to the global level because this is just a fraction of those who eventually could die, all right? Um, what else? The fifth option is diagnosis of severe infection by a trained health worker or doctor at the primary health care facility after care has been thought. So this saves lives by reducing the number of cases of severe sepsis who reach primary health care but never get referred to hospital. So this would uh, correct for the doctor missing the true severity or parents not complying. It could work for those two channels, improve doctor's um, judgment whether to uh, move them to hospital or improve parents' um, eagerness to go to uh, and seek treatment at secondary health care. The test would clearly need to be extremely sensitive and specific, but it would have large life-saving potential and this is what we suspect would happen. 44% would reach hospital anyway, but if 56% do not, this is the number of the severe cases that could be helped. If 40% can access to secondary health care, this is what would happen, the difference in case fatality rate among those who <coughs> seek care. 213 deaths averted, which means 9% effectiveness in newborns with suspected infection who come to primary health care. So in fact it is less than the previous example, the previous case. Um, it is uh, obviously quite modest in global terms but still useful. Now what if you could tell exact etiological diagnosis by a trained uh, uh, health worker or doctor at the primary health care uh, facility. How does this save lives? Well, by changing the effectiveness of antibiotic treatment, we, because here we're assuming that the doctor at primary health care has a range of antibiotics and just picks one based on his best judgment, but if he or she knew exactly uh, what is the agent, then maybe they would choose different antibiotics and clearly, uh, again, what would be the life-saving potential? Let's see. Um, dum -ba -dum. Uh, among them, obviously this would be true sepsis, 35% effectiveness on antibiotic treatment without knowing the etiology. So basically here we would almost have 100% uh, effectiveness of antibiotic treatment and this is the difference uh, where the lives get saved. So uh, now antibiotic treatment becomes more effective than if you're just guessing. And it looks like thanks to that and assuming that antibiotics are available of all sorts that could help, this actually would have quite a lot of reduction in mortality because you, you would know exactly what you're doing and clearly if uh, you know exactly what you're doing, you, you uh, I mean dying at this level is really dependent on clinical algorithm uh, and uh, imperfection and also antibiotics only being 35% effective. If you could increase effectiveness of antibiotics to 80-85% at this level and improve clinical algorithm to 100%, clearly you're going to have a life-saving potential much better. And now we move to secondary health care. So what if you had um, the test at the secondary health care level? We said that at this level we do not care uh, whether it's severe or not because that's primarily important to us to decide whether to send them to hospital. But what if we knew here that the infectious was, infection was bacterial. That would only have an effect on those 
two sepsis cases who reach the hospitals but never get treatment with antibiotics because the doctor missed the correct diagnosis due to imperfect clinical algorithm. The test would need to be extremely sensitive and specific to really improve on what's already going on in the hospitals because doctors will probably give antibiotic anyway and, and try to save the child. So basically uh, this should have a minuscule potential. And then you finally have the last um, example where you actually can give a proper uh, antibiotic at the hospital and clearly this should improve the, um, uh, the, the results somewhat although who knows how much because you would imagine that in the hospital the doctors would just keep giving all antibiotics they have if the child is not getting better so you know whether you really need such tests at the hospital or not is, is questionable and this is what we figured out would happen at the global uh, level if we had various um, uh, perfect screening tests. If you had active screening for bacterial infection in all healthy newborns, you know, a few days after they're born, you could pick up and change care-seeking behavior and save up to 20% of those million deaths or 900,000 deaths. If you could diagnose bacterial infection among suspected infections at a community level, you would save 12%. Severe infections among suspected infection at the community level, 17%. So that's great because you would really improve the referral to hospitals uh, for those who really need that. Bacterial among suspected infection care seekers in primary health care. You see that sounded a lot at first, but it's only really 3% globally. 1.5% the severe one, 6% exact etiology at the level of primary health care, perhaps still worth it. And then this at the hospital, as I predicted, way less than or 1% really. So uh, this is what the Gates wanted to know. They wanted to know what of this is worth going into because they don't want to be spending so much money and time if they can only reduce the thing by 1% and the whole thing is being reduced anyway because of the development and improvement and education and so on and so on. So maybe there is, it's much better to focus on changes of care seeking behavior than on the diagnostics. I mean in Gates they're always interested in new technologies and uh, biotech and diagnostics and so on. But in fact, you know, if, if you can <laughs> change things through improved care seeking behavior and uh, enhanced uh, clinical algorithm by training better the community health workers, which this all shows you, then why in the world bother developing some sort of biomarker which you also have to deliver, make sure that it works, make sure that people know how to use. For all that trouble, maybe it's just better to increase care seeking behavior and pay for, uh, introduce some vouchers for taxis to seek hospital uh, care for women in, who live in poverty and, and something like that or a service to, to take care of her children while she is away at the hospital with a sick child. So basically, you know, uh, this was very useful to them because clearly they could see this is not feasible uh, to do. So maybe this is feasible, maybe this is feasible, this is all probably not worth it. And, and, and you know, focusing on really diagnosing, really this one, this one was the winner of all eight scenarios. Diagnostics to, to diagnose severe infection among suspected infections and community level. That would help. If you could empower community health workers to carry a perfect diagnostics for severe infection and recognize that this is absolutely critical. It's a life endangered child, uh, give them antibiotic and refer them to hospital. If community health workers could do that, there would be life-saving potential there. Everything else is just simply out of reach because people either don't even seek care or don't even recognize the symptoms. If, if, mother, if the mother doesn't even recognize the symptoms, they will not seek care, then nobody is even going to know that the child is sick and they may die two days later. So there's just nothing we can do about those, you know. So no matter how sophisticated biomarkers we have. So this really was eye-opening to many because they were fantasizing about these perfect biomarkers, changing everything, saving hundreds of thousands of lives. And then they could realize, no, <laughs> it's not about the biomarkers. They could help, but it's about the whole social autopsy of each child and the problems that are social uh, uh, in nature 
uh, of, of uh, parents being uneducated, mothers not recognizing signs, being inexperienced, um, you know, not having support from uh, grandmothers or whoever, uh, not having access to hospitals, uh, uh, not having access to any health care. Those are the problems. Those are the big problems of global health, not the high-tech stuff. And, and this was also eye-opening to them in a more ways than one because they realized that high-tech stuff is not going to save the world if the world is still so underdeveloped and there are so many social uh, problems. You have to work on those <laughs> and you can do more uh, by uh, changing social determinants of health than you can do with some super high-tech technologies. Super high-tech technologies are changing the way we live in high-income countries, but if you have no electricity, no roads, no power, no uh, knowledge, no schools, then you know, no technology is going to penetrate uh, and change anything there. That's the problem. So what are the conclusions? There are eight apparent points of possible intervention with a diagnostic test from the health system's perspective. Any estimate of effectiveness for the option one and three will be relevant to all 900,000 deaths. Any estimate of effectiveness for the options four to six will only be relevant to 150,000 deaths. This is already telling you if you can only <laughs> give diagnostics to a primary health care uh, level, you are leaving massive amount of deaths out of reach and, and you're not going to change anything. And if you're only developing a diagnostics for a hospital level uh, and you need a laboratory and all sorts of uh, stuff, well, you're only really uh, going to be able to affect 50,000 deaths, which are probably unavertable uh, anyway, because they're happening in the hospital where people will still try everything to save a baby, right? So, maximum potential of diagnostic tests to remove burden will happen when it can be applied at the community level. Other levels could have much more impact if care-seeking behavior could be improved and if access to antibiotics and healthcare could be improved. Then you also could have more impact here if more of these deaths would be referred to. So the more realistic the context for test implementation, the less opportunity for potential large impact of the test. That's the problem here. You know, the more realistic the context where you can implement some uh, high-tech diagnostics, the, the less impact you can have because they've already died outside of the hospital. Even the absolutely perfect test, which would be, have 100% sensitivity and specificity, extremely low cost, no laboratory requirements, easy to use, will have very limited effectiveness because of two factors. Firstly, at the community level, the prognosis for those correctly diagnosed is still rather poor. The opportunities for saving lives are missed because they may not choose to comply, so you need to educate parents. The community health workers are not allowed to treat, which is a need for legislation change. The effectiveness of treatment by community health workers may not be high, so you need to train the community health workers. And the referral to primary and secondary health care may be largely failing due to poverty and poor access, so you need conditional cash transfers and improved access. So look at what would help education, legislation change, training, conditional cash transfers, improved access. Those are the things that you would help, not the, <laughs> not the diagnostics or technology itself. It's all sorts of other things. And at the facility level, there are simply much fewer deaths to be averted. And the cluster more severe cases which still have high mortality regardless of the test, while the validity of clinical algorithm can be improved as much using the test. So obvious conclusions, diagnostic tests could save many lives and we should continue to invest in them to improve their validity, deliverability, affordability. However, this investment should not be happening in isolation from parallel investment in improving these eight contexts so the test could realize lots more of their potential. We should evaluate programs for education of parents to improve compliance, promote legislation change to empower community health workers to become an active part in this. Evaluate programs for training community health workers to use test and administer treatments correctly. Improve care-seeking behavior for programs of conditional case, uh, cash transfers. And most importantly, improve access to primary and secondary health care for everyone so that the majority of suspected infections are seen in the context where the difference between health systems intervention and non-intervention uh, is the largest which means we need universal health care, right? So all, all roads lead to the same uh, conclusion that in health you just need to try to cover everyone. That's much better than giving superb care to some while leaving others out. 
Thank you very much for your attention. All right.